fighting at the start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is um, really quite an informal session on, on broadening and deepening student engagement. So from the feedback forms we got from the last session, uh, people wanted to know sort of where they could go for resources, but also uh, how they could encourage students towards wider reading and how they could get students to develop their points in more detail in their writing. So our very qualified speakers are going to speak about that. I'm not going to speak about that because I'm not a trained teacher, so I keep being very consciously aware of that. So I'm going to talk a bit about specifically for American literature, but also other things, places you can go for resources. Um, Louise Northey, who's head of English at Rains Foundation School in Bethnal Green. So how long have you been head of English there for? Ten years. Ten years, so yeah, very and experienced. Then, yeah, and then two years with some of these guys at Twyford. Yeah, so yeah before that. and she's yeah. done research into teaching Shakespeare. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm currently just finishing off a PhD where I've been researching teacher and student views on the place of literature at uh, Key Stage 4. Um, so yeah, I've been looking at that. Yep, um, uh, so she's going to be one of our speakers. And then Colette Mahmoud, who uh, is a former, former English teacher, former assistant head, uh, in an academy, uh, director, of studies. director of studies, and is currently doing a PhD at Royal Holloway in our English department. What's your PhD on? Uh, Dickens and fetish. <laughs> Maybe not so much. No pictures, please. Yes. Hello, my name is Douglas Cowie. I teach American literature and creative writing uh, in the English department at Royal Hall University of London. Um, I've got five things I want to talk about in relation to creative writing. They're all kind of general. I'm going to talk about them in terms of fiction writing because I'm myself uh, a fiction writer. I mostly write novels. And so those are going to be my examples. Uh, they're going to come from fiction and the terms in which I talk will be in terms of fiction. But again, I think these things are all applicable to other forms of writing, not just fiction with some adaptation. So the five things I'm going to talk about are reading, which is the most important thing, I think, writing, uh, experience, writing, again, and process. I put writing in there twice, and I hope it'll make sense why. Um, I'm, it's not really cheating. Um, there's two different ways I want to talk about writing. So the first thing is reading. I think the most important, absolutely the most important thing for trying to learn to write well is to learn to read and to learn to read well. And I think that's a difficult thing sometimes to do on one's own. It's where a teacher is probably the most helpful person uh, in the process because a, a teacher has more experience of reading. And a teacher knows a whole variety of things that he or she has read and can bring to the student to read. And uh, exposing students to a wide variety of things is the most important thing. So when I'm teaching short story writing, for example, I try to bring in not just a few stories from the recent past or from the 20th century, but a whole variety of things, um, because a short story by Langston Hughes isn't the same as a short story by Herman Melville, isn't the same as a short story by Sarah Orne Jewett or Kate Chopin or Raymond Carver or um, Grace Paley. I mean, there's a, there's a, such a variety of people just in American literature. Uh, so I wanted to show you that beginning bit because I thought as well as being really good at talking about kind of the process of creative writing, I understand the use of language as well. <laughs> Uh, these videos are meant to be accessible to both teachers and students so that you can show them in your classrooms, but also Doug's just sort of reading off of texts that you might want to teach in his, the way that Doug does, he just kind of throws things out there. Um, so hopefully they're, they're kind of resources that you guys can use as well as your students. <coughs> the second place that I would suggest you go is the British Association for American Studies, and I guess I have a vested interest because I'm on their executive committee. Um, but as an or organisation, they are really committed to increasing teaching of and awareness of American literature, American history, American politics in schools. It is free to join the association as a school. So you as teachers can join on behalf of your school. Um, so only one person per school, but you can all share the resources. Um, 
this means, like, firstly, you're on our radar. So if we're doing events about American things, we will get in contact with you. We're trying to build a school's resources page at the moment, so we'd really like to hear what people want. And I think kind of probably best of all is get access to the Journal of American Studies. It's the Cambridge University Press Academic Journal. It's probably the leading journal of written field. Um, uh, so you can log in, once you get your membership details, you can log in through the website and that will give you access. Um, so join for that reason, if nothing else. Um, they also, and also because like, we like knowing which teachers are interested in American literature, we like knowing what people are doing. Uh, we also run a teacher fellowship competition, I think yearly, that sends a teacher to Monticello, uh, Thomas Jefferson's house in, in Virginia. It's very beautiful, I've been, can <laughs> recommend it. Um, so there's also just one more thing, is the BAS paperback series, um, which uh, you've got a, a flyer about and a discount code for in your, in your uh, little pamphlet. And they <coughs> are on um, all sorts of topics, literature, history, culture for the US, the Civil War, um, and they're really good introductory volumes. So if you're looking for things to add to your school library, uh, they might be good ones to go for. Um, and that's really all I'm gonna say. So I'll hand over to so, um, yeah, I've been asked to talk a little bit about how we can encourage our students to be independent readers. Um, I think this is a, it is a struggle. It's a big struggle, and I think it's um, one that particularly becomes acute when you start moving towards coursework option, where students are being asked to choose their own texts and to be able to compare them and, and to kind of... I can see some people nodding <laughs> knowingly at that situation. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through some of the things that I think are initial problems we have and ways that maybe I, I've worked to try and kind of combat these issues. I think we have to be realistic in terms of there are going to be barriers to reading that a lot of our students will have in terms of their own access to texts. I mean, it depends very much obviously on where you work and the kind of the class of children that you're teaching. I mean, where I am in East London, a lot of the students I teach I know don't have any books in their homes and their access with books are the ones that they read in school. For, for some of them, Of Mice and Men may be the only novel that they've ever been all the way through of. Um, there's also a, a lack of ideas. They, they, they might read some really good teenage fiction, but that's where they stop and they don't know how to get out of that. They don't know what the next part of it is. Um, and some of them are just not natural readers. It's not what they do. They, they can't concentrate all the way through a text. They, they want to know. It's like when you put, um, we do ever do this, surely. But when you put a film on and <laughs> you've, you've been in about 30 <laughs> seconds and they want to know where, what's going to happen and why that, who that person is and all that. They want everything to be very kind of there and, and, and straight away. So it's kind of that teaching them that perseverance. So I think the first thing is, is you do need to start them young. You need to, as a teacher, kind of train them up into realising that reading is absolutely a fine thing to do and it's what we do. So I don't know whether you are in schools that have designated reading lessons. Uh, we do in my department. One of the stipulations of that in my department is that the teacher who's in there has to be reading too. They can't use that time to be doing their marking. I want to go in and see them reading too. I want them to tell the kids what they're reading. I want them then to ask kids to come up and talk about their books, have some designated time in there so they can say what they're reading. Pushing kid, kids, kids as well away from just that teenage literature. So it's, it's one of those things that you can begin um, early on. And also as well, if you've got year 11 students that you want to keep on into your course, you want to get them in your course for A-level, like giving them selection of text to read over the summer, giving them some pre-reading to do, but not just maybe a reading list, getting that book, putting it in their hands. You, you know, as a teacher, you're going to be facilitating that. I mean, one of the points that I've, I've, I've written down here is that you've got to be prepared to lend out your books and lose them. You know, you've got to be able to do that. I have lost so many of my favourite texts over the years because I've given them to sixth form students. I was like, you know, go and read this, go and do that. I did get one back eventually once. I, I lent out uh, Catcher in the Rye to a student at, at Twice Bridge years back who we'd been having a conversation about it, and I gave it to him. And I got it back three years later. <laughs> um, and it did look like it had been read, so that was quite good. <laughs> but be prepared to do that. You know, you've got to sort of show them that reading isn't just about the reading in class. It's something you do beyond that. Um, course structures. Don't just be blinded by set texts. Bring in other things that you can teach that are not set texts. Um, 
use this time at the end of year 12 where it's all a little bit not quite sure what's going on. There yes. might be work experience. Someone might have an AS in something. Someone suddenly got a deadline they didn't realise. It's all a bit more amor uh, amorphous. Use that time to teach some things that maybe you just really love or that may have come up in conversation. Um, I mean, <coughs> also when you're choosing those set texts, think about set texts that can be springboard texts. So I did Rebecca for the first time this year. I know not an American novel, but I, I did Rebecca. And that then prompted some to read Jane Eyre, which then prompted some to read Why the Gas OC, which then also facilitated some conversations about the Gothic. Someone went and read some Edgar Allan Poe. So it's, it's having those springboard texts that you can use. Um, the other thing, too, is also think about you, what your students are actually interested in. Involve them in what they want to read. We haven't taught the same thing, um, I don't know, for year, every year we teach something new. Every year we bring something new in because we look at the kids that are coming through and we think, what might they be interested in? At the beginning of the year, I'll hand out some books, I'll buy lots in and say, right, just take some of these away, what do you think? The reason I ended up doing Rebecca this year with my year 12s was I couldn't decide between the Rotters Club or Rebecca. They went away, st started reading them, they came back in, they went, love the Rotters Club, this, love it. We don't know how we're going to compare it to the other texts, so we're going to have to do Rebecca. <laughs> so that's how it came <laughs> yeah. out. But we've still kind of brought the Rotters Club, and they've got that now as an extra bit of reading that they've done. Um, also, as well, I think, going back to the springboard text, you can bring in things that are going to get them interested because they're illicit. Never underestimate the thing that's got sex and violence in it. Never <laughs> underestimate that. Um, I'm a big Brett Easton Ellis fan, and I'll have that little conversation kind of, if you want to read something really filthy, <laughs> I'll, give, I'll direct you to that chapter that I couldn't read on the tube because it was just yeah. utter filth. Um, but that can, you know, that can promote some of that reading, that idea that what they're doing is actually something a bit cheeky. Uh, I mean, even you know Chaucer for that. <coughs> I mean, I, I had one of my students, I sent them... Uh, the, one of the PowerPoints on Merchant's Tale, and they went, if my dad saw that slide, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the one with Priapus on it. Yeah. <laughs> you know that slide, you see that one. But I think never underestimate the, the power of the illicit. Um, linked to that as well, I do think film can be our friends. And I think bad film versions can be our friends. When an, in, an, an adaptation is not particularly good, they can get quite passionate about the text. Gatsby, I would say, is an example <laughs> of that. Um, we've had some great conversations. Um, we haven't watched it in class. They've kind of gone and watched it themselves. But it's made them so much more enthusiastic with the text. So whenever there is a film adaptation of a text that comes out, I think this, use that. Get them to maybe see it and then say, go and read it and see what you think and get that discussion. Um, and then also just pushing boundaries with them. Um, poetry. You know, no one... Really, I don't know. I'm sorry. This is a terrible thing. I think I've got a reputation in my department for not being a massive fan of poetry, um, and I put my hand out. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to admit. Hi, my name's Louise. I don't really like poetry, <laughs> um, and I think part of the problems that I have with that is I do find it hard to read. I find it hard to sit and just read poetry. Um, so I've been sat with my sixth formers the last couple of weeks doing that. And just talking about it as, not as something analytical, but just as something that we have a response to. So literally today, we sat and we looked at these poems from the English and Media Centre have got a competition about kind of some uh, po poetry criticism, and you can write your own poem in response, or you can write a, a just a response. And we sat and read these poems today, and I said, oh, let's just talk about whether we like them, or we don't like them, or they make us feel something, or they don't make us feel something. Best discussion I've ever had with this group. And I know that they're then going, going to go away and read things from that. So I think there's lots and lots of things you can do where you've got to take those blinkers of the assessment objectives away. Mm -hmm. And you've got to think about what the fundamentals are actually of why we became English teachers was because we like reading books. I mean, I think back to my degree. I couldn't read a novel for about three or four years after my degree because I couldn't stop analysing it. Um, and it... And I, Actually, Kindles have been great for me because I can't mm -hmm. fold pages over and I can't write on it. So that's quite good. I just read. So I think we need to move away from that blinker of just it's all about that end product of the exam and try and build that enthusiasm and provide them with those resources and direct them quite a bit, actually. We do need to direct them because until we do that, they can't be independent. And I, th I think those are the sort of things we need to think about.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Colette, do you want to take us on that? Yeah. Um, if you look in your folder, you've got um, a sheet. Uh, broadening and deepening student engagement. I'm not going to read it through because I know you can all read. I will refer to it occasionally. Um, I'll start off by agreeing completely with what Louise has just said about um, the varying abilities. I'm aware that you, you all teach different levels. And as an examiner, I've seen stunning, amazing essays and essays that come through that would fail at GCSE. Um, I've had some interesting comments. I've had uh, essays that start off brilliantly and I've turned the page and the student has written a note, that's it, I hated the text, I hate my teacher, <laughs> I'm not writing another thing. And you just think, oh, you, you were on an A, an A star, and they've just stopped because they hated the text so much. And that actually really hugely ties in with what Louise was saying, is have these great conversations about, in year 11 as well, in year 10, about where they're heading and what they like, and really think about where, what text you're going to choose together, if you can, because it has such an impact on their enjoyment and again with the AOs I would say when you're teaching them to write an essay just leave those AOs out of it at first even in your feedback because when you write to assessment objectives it's a clunky mechanical chunky essay and it takes the joy out of writing for them and it should be a pleasurable experience where the ideas eventually at the end of year 13, whatever level, just come from them onto the paper. Because that's what, believe it or not, the exam boards are trying to elicit is their thoughts, not what the teacher told them. And I see that quite frequently when I mark um, and exam papers come you, don't, you obviously don't know what school they're from and you, you know, there are no names on there, but you get them in blocks from the school. And I can see some of them are just like a mirror version. They're, they're, they're almost point for point. And I've ha even had to refer so to um, some to the example because they're so exactly like each other. And they get very low mark because there's no real development of thought there. So really move away from the AOs at the beginning, put them on at the end. You can give your feedback about different interpretations, context, analysis, without mentioning AO2, AO3, AO4. It just kills the writing if you do that. And the exam board don't like it either. They don't like um, to see to, or to hear that you're giving feedback by writing AO2 in, in the margin. And you know what your students are like when they get their written feedback. They really just want to know the grade. <laughs> and they don't really want to spend a huge amount of time looking at all your details. So don't over feedback. Work out the one thing each time that would improve that essay and just stick, if you can, to one thing that they can focus on and that you can really ask them to do the next essay work on that specific thing. If you bombard with AO2, AO3, AO4, AO5, and all these points, they'll give you the same essay they gave last time. Um, and I think we've all experienced that. Um, I would say on improving skills, really, really important that your students understand those prompt words. Do they know the difference between analysis, explain? Do they know the difference between explore, examine? Or is it at Jackson Pollock, ugh, just everything on the paper? So take some time at the beginning of year 12 to go through those prompt words. And I would really highly recommend, it's on the bottom under the resources, um, is a Prezi. I don't know how many of you use Prezi instead of PowerPoint, but I would really recommend them. Really interactive. And anyway, this is a particularly good one. Um, this uh, Charissa Zico, she's, she's written quite a few. And this one on uh, Ten Commandments of Writing is excellent. There's uh, videos embedded, there are little exercises embedded, all the resources.
but the prompt words that I've just mentioned are on there in printable form. So I really recommend that, and she's done quite a few that are a great help. And your students can go back and refer to them. Um, I won't go through um, the strong thesis statement because you can read that for yourself and that's also covered um, in that particular Prezi. Uh, just a little bit about answering in depth and moving away from those mechanical points where you and encouraging your student to get their ideas on the paper. Um, I was saying before the so what rule. And the so what is every time they go to write anything, the question is, yeah, well, so what? And yes, so what? And keep doing that. And when they're talking to you in the classroom and they give you a point, I mean, there's a nice way to do it. You don't just want to go, so what? But explain what you're doing and why you're trying to tease out a bit more depth. Well, so what? Does that further the plot? So what? Does that build a character? Well, so what? Does that change um, the direction that the text is going? And then they'll nearly always have a response. It's just they don't think to go that far. So get them to push that point a little bit more. Um, and and that that's, goes hand in hand with those two key words when they're learning how to write an introduction, which is such an important part of the essay. When you've got 500 essays to mark as an examiner, you have to have a sort of uh, format for getting through them. And like it or <laughs> lump it really, the introduction tells you an awful lot about where the essay is heading and you know that, you mark all the time. And the introduction is so important for starting off with that great first impression. Um, so when you do those sort of mini plans in lessons, and you get them to do them for homework. The key words are why and how. They're, all, they're very, very good at putting the what down. Mm. They can tell you what, and they can tell you when, and they love all that, and they're, and they're great on <laughs> themes, but when you, that, well, how, and there's an example, as you'll see, that I've given there, and the why, they're the key. They're what lead them into um, Argument one, argument two, counter-argument, because someone else doesn't think it happens like that. And they're the way that you can open up into those connections and other interpretations. So I think those two words, particularly for weaker students, the how and the why, are really helpful, because that's the kind of thing that they can, if you like, latch on to, and that helps them get from the beginning of the essay to the end and get over that. I'm halfway and I've got nothing else to say moment. Um, and then just a couple of other points on answering in depth. Even really good quality students forget to talk about style. They forget to say whether something is ironic and how or why. <laughs> and they forget to say whether something is comic. You can get to the end of something where they're writing about a Carol Ann Duffy poem and they just completely omit to talk about the humour because it's not a theme, so it doesn't end up in their <laughs> essay, and it's not a character. So build in that. Well, did you find it funny? Did you find it dark? And give them different words. Give them words, tonal words, like melancholy and sombre, so we don't see sad all the time or happy. <laughs> <laughs> so those, yeah, building up those words is so, is so useful. It, is, it, um, is it macabre rather than scary, which you still see at A-level, sadly? Um, that, that's really very, very good for an examiner to see, that a student can write about the tone of something. You don't see it that often, and examiners love to see that a student's got what the author might have been trying to do here, mm -hmm. and, and an extra layer if you've got the tone in there. Um, and then so very much linked to that is, is attitudes and values, and you know you have the best conversations like you did with your mm -hmm. poetry, about, well, what do you think about it? Get those attitudes and values in there, because it's not all about theme, and it's not all about character. Um, and I, I would just like to recommend, I absolutely adore this book by Francine Prose. What a fabulous <laughs> name. So, um, it's called Reading Like a Writer. Um, it's a guide for people who love books and for those who want to write them. But it's so 
um, fabulous for lesson planning. And just some of the chapters in here. Um, it starts off, it's all about close reading. And a lot of American text in there, a lot of American text in there, which is very useful. Um, and she starts with words, and then she moves on to sentences, paragraphs, narratives, character dialogue, detail, gesture, and it's beautifully done. She's so passionate about what she does. And actually, it would work with film as well, that um, deconstruction, but not in a deadly way, mm -hmm. in a really exciting way. So. I hugely recommend that, and I'm sure most of you have probably got The Art of Fiction by David Lodge, but that's, again, a lot of really good American authors in there, um, and the chapters in that look at tone and style, so they look at um, the comic novel, magical realism, staying on the showing and telling, a sense of the past, and taking sort of different tones, different moods, different values. And there's just a short extract and some talking, some writing about it. And that's great for the beginning of year 12, just to get a feel for your students. You pick one of those, give them the extract, and have a conversation about it. And you're building up those layers right from the beginning. So, thanks I very much. I feel like that's a lot of the stuff. Really <laughs> good advice for us as well. <laughs> well I, I was really, really conscious as we're talking about how we're all in the same business. And I was thinking at one end, I'm a parent governor in a, in a very, very mist, mixed ethnically and language, multi-language primary school where the transition week we've used this week to get them to think about poetry. And we used a slightly um, Kate Tempest uh, thing mm. at Glastonbury with a little bit of parental advisory is a great place to get <laughs> to start. But also, our colleagues, we are ask, asking the same questions, in, particularly in year one, is the breadth of reading and the yeah. breadth of, um, I suppose, just uh, what you can refer to is yeah. incredibly tricky. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we have colleagues now re re doing reading labs where they get 40 people in a room to read. And they read with them the same mm -hmm. way. And they read with them, they model yeah. them. They get them to leave their mobile yeah. phones at the front. Yeah. Uh, they kind of get them to stretch their reading time from five minutes, literally. I didn't know you could read for longer than 10 minutes. It's, yeah. a, it's but your reading, Elizabeth Gaskell. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, to, to, to kind of an hour's reading. And there's those sorts of modeling. And it, it's, it's really crucial. But I know you've got questions. Yeah. And so we sort of, I think we're bleeding Sorry. into closing remarks and all but kinds of times. But, yeah. but we'll just use it and, and yeah. answer questions. And so it might help I cure me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it embraces hate and poetry, and I think I, I teach that to third years, and they, they come in hate, absolutely hate it. Yeah. But it's a really wonderful book for talking about why we all hate it. Well, and I think kind of embracing that, that side of it, and it's quite good fun for that. But I think sometimes it's actually also quite good to embrace what you don't like. And yeah. that's one of the com like, I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues earlier about um, this idea that students get angry with a text if they don't like it. And I'm like, we well, don't have to like it. That's kind of part of the enjoyment. I mean, lots of my favorite texts I don't like, but I really enjoy them because I enjoy what they make me think about. And the fact that they get me angry or that I don't like the way they've been written in some ways because I've got something I want to say about them. So I think sometimes actually not liking something can be a great way of getting into wanting to analyze it. I use it as starting points in seminars as well. Like, did you like it? If you didn't like it, why? It does. It, it gives you a point to, to develop more than that just gut response to it. Uh, comments were allowed as well, and, and it, I mean, this takes us beyond the, the, the American dream. Yeah, <laughs> some level, but maybe maybe not. I mean, um, just sort of, and, and more things about what. What do you find the most challenging parts of the teaching? What would be useful for you to have as teachers? More, more time to talk with each other? I, would say I, I think resources and, and more time and unlimited resources to keep it. So when somebody can go and talk, because the mm -hmm. school doesn't pay for it, Jane's school. Yeah. Um, I think within a month we have it. Yes, oh, because they want to ask. How them. much can we download <laughs> in a month? Yeah. 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 
it is worth asking around to see if within your school if you've got anyone who is doing like an MA or something like that who has got access, who's prepared to yeah, kind of help you out. And sometimes as some, some universities will do alumni access mm -hmm. as yeah. well. So it's worth investigating that. Yeah. Yeah. The English and Media Centre, mm -hmm. um, they are excellent for very accessible, um, I, I think if you do their online e-magazine um, for a year, it's, it's really good value. And if you're a bit of a cheapskate like my school, you do it for a year and you just download everything as PDFs. But they're really well written, and some of them are also written by sixth form students, so it's good modelling as well, that written style. They're very, very accessible, I think, and I've used those a lot this year. What, what we have just in terms of teacher hub, by the way, is to get colleagues who use the field to, I'd recommend, open access things, so things that don't charge. So if you go onto the teacher hub, I think most of the things are open Yeah, all the links are, all the links are, are open, open access, access so. and everything on the, there's a printed resource list, everything there on that is, is open access. Um, sorry, there was another question yeah. over there. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one thing that would be really helpful um, is particularly for sixth form because it's given the way things are structured, it's you know a few pack students, but they they also want to be on something that's going to yeah. quite make them sweat. Um, with with the sort of recent new details and that that just hanging either you know students or university students or lecturers that actually disagree on the context. Mm. Of right. So sort and of debate. Yeah, no, podcasting is definitely something that we, we were thinking about doing, and I, but I like that idea mm. of a few of us, because we love talking about books, and we love disagreeing <laughs> with each other, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if there were a topic, just off the top of your head, that you'd like to see people to debate, <laughs> great gathering, you'd like a, a stage for that. There's no one authoritative text book, lots of critiques, is there? Yeah. yeah. No, exactly, so great gathering yeah. would be. Would be, I mean, I don't know what the first year poetry course is doing next year, but it strikes me that like, kind of you both annotate and discuss. Yeah. And I teach a course called Thinking of the Critic, which is the first year's mm -hmm. uh, sort of introduction to literary studies, essentially. So we think about history, context, we think about close reading, why do we do it, what is it all about? And that idea of getting them to both annotate and talk to each other about it, I think, would be a really good exercise. So that yeah. you're getting the round, double whammy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they get a I yeah. think also I think it might be useful as well something about um, you know teaching students the understanding of, of how a collection of poetry by one poet works because yeah. mm. you know for a lot of them their experience of poetry has been anthologies of yeah. different poets and they see poems as individual units mm -hmm. not as a collection and I think they sometimes struggle to be able to write about a collection of poetry mm -hmm. so something on that I think would be interesting just to show a poetry I used to teach Jane Shapcock poetry at um, 
She's asked about her own website because she's getting so many um, FAQs from A level teachers. <laughs> and she actually offered to do a workshop for us on Potter. Yes. Maybe we could mm -hmm. share that with you. She did, that's it. Yeah, it was just, she's the only thing to ask, right? <laughs> the cloak. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> that reading resilience and reading lab uh, are two very googleable terms and I know that one of our professors has put a lot of time into finding good sources for talking about their things maybe we could think about passing um, some yeah. of those up yeah um, and think about Judith's work in particular um, um, uh, Um, sorry, just something that's relevant to that and relevant to your question. Um, we ran a thing uh, for year 11s and, and it went for year 10s as well because it was so popular and we did one a term and they had to pay, um, in theory, it was a voluntary amount because the, the schools in quite a wealthy area it might not be the case for other schools. But it was a lecture seminar after school and we offered them pizza <laughs> to get them in. <laughs> but um, we gave them the text, and we actually used the texts that were coming up in their exams, but you don't have to, and poetry was very popular. And, we, and they could select which lecture they were going to, so that was a bit of a buzz. Mm -hmm. It was after school, they came in their own clothes, so that was a bit exciting. You know what it does to them <laughs> when they've got their own stuff on. <laughs> and then they would choose um, a lecture to go to, and then, a, and then we had smaller seminars, and they absolutely loved it. And it really changed the way they behaved after that, mm -hmm. and they got into that whole idea of sharing ideas. Well, we started with year 11, first of all, to see if it, and then we went down to year 10, and then year 9, we said, well, can we come after school in our clothes and have pizza and talk about books? And said, well, yeah, absolutely. Well, we're doing a lunchbox uh, that we do with, with year 5s and 6 in primary school, mm -hmm. and I just feel like that we're going to benefits of that and yeah. having sis so excited and one of the ones in particular you know, get them reading anything but the thing um, for young boys in particular has been the football or Facebook yeah. but they'll read ten of them you know mm. the kind of Frankie Lampard goes to Rome and plays yeah. football <laughs> yeah. 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 they're fantastic yeah. <laughs> but it's, it really is at that moment at that time it's about vocabulary extension yeah. Yeah. and all of that but to do it in an informal setting And a funny thing has been getting individual teachers of that level to put up a, a list of their five favourite books. So you've got the sports teacher putting up the book set, you know, things that you would, cookie books, art books, all kinds of books, non-fiction, fiction, just that it's a presence in the classroom. Um, and this is a school that finds it hard to hit reading level.
Yeah. I do that with my, the first thing yes. session I do with my foundation tutorials when I, tutors, so we have a, a scheme where we see our first years in small groups every other week. And I sit down and go, well, wh why are you here? Like, what's this, what's the subject about? Like, what, what is the point of doing English? Are we, are we studying great books? Or are we thinking about the stories that people have told or haven't been able to tell at different points in time? Are we thinking about the, the the relationship between literature and history, are we thinking about literature as art and aesthetic? And just asking all those questions. And I think it would be definitely possible to ask those in sort of different forms. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. just thinking of my own research that I've been doing, which is around mm -hmm. this question of why, you know, why do we teach literature? One of the things that's been absolutely fascinating is this dichotomy between what the students think they're taught it for and why <laughs> teachers think they teach it. The students think they're taught it so that they get writing skills and analysis. Teachers are thinking that they're teaching literature to promote creativity and this kind of spiritual, moral kind of understanding Matthew of others. Matthew Arnold. Yeah, completely. <laughs> and and it, it's really interesting that, and actually hardly any of the students say that they think it's about creativity. Hardly any of them. And actually then when you look at what, what the teachers then say that they are doing in, in lessons, there's very little actual kind of creative elements in it. So I find that really fascinating because we do, we think we're doing something, we want to do something and yet we don't do it because we're kind of, hemmed in again by those mm. kind of, you know, grades and assessments and all those things, which I think is, is really sad. Mm. And, w and that's why these sort of things are so important, because we're here thinking about that and we want to do that in the classroom. Mm. That's that, really, that really ties with, um, like, we're doing an exercise about my actual allergies just yet at the moment. And, um, Boo, sorry. <laughs> 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 Not you, the IGCSE. <laughs> 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 Rubbish meanings, as one of the kids in my research put it. One of the kids calls it rubbish meanings. Looking for rubbish meanings. <laughs> month of the year we all celebrate and pretend <laughs> it's important and actually it's it's rubbish 
and the students really, really seem to love that because it sets out to have a, maybe there is not a deep meaning, maybe society doesn't need it, and for that very reason, let's enjoy it. And it leads them more to enjoyment of poetry as opposed to, again, that I've said this so much today, but that utility of it will reveal a kernel of truth about itself. <laughs> Sometimes form can be a way through. Yeah. We're used to thinking about deeper meanings all the, all, all the time. Let's write a villanelle. And I have to always check what a villanelle is. And I'm <laughs> teaching, you know, but, you know, how do you know that? But it's, it's great. And of course, kids, well, particularly, I think they do, they do think formally. They think about rap. They think about different music forms. They yeah. think about different rhythm. They, you know, we, I think we probably should. Sad. I think this is such really a sad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the things that people asked on the feedback forms last yeah. time yeah. was that um, we gave more time over the discussion by professing to discuss text and kind yeah. of a discussion to hear from teachers. So we hope we've kind of been able to extend that a little bit tonight. Um, I also wanted, um, I, I hope that both of you are involved in research at the moment. Um, from, so the next round of MA recruitment, we got from the English department what's called an MA fee waiver for anybody who wants to apply to do an MA in the department um, on an, in English. So you can go to our, our uh, departmental website, you can send an email, an email as I think I said uh, before, and you won't have to pay MA fees. Um, most of our MAs, or many of our MAs, are taught at times where you can combine them, do them either part-time or do them full-time if you, if you can wangle a little bit of writing up time, um, in the evening. So a lot of sessions start by run five to seven, mm -hmm. um, and they're always designed that way, uh, particularly the Shakespeare one, because there used to be a kind of, um, uh, you know, well, schools used to pay for people to do their <laughs> notes, and they don't anymore, let's <laughs> put it that way. So think about it on the beach with your reading lists that you've got <laughs> this evening, and think about applying in the autumn for for the following year. And we have found schools quite supportive of that, as long as they don't have to pay for it <laughs> in the past. And we've got people's yeah. industrial training. I was going to say, just in case it's not clear, it's just one MA fee. Right? Yes, it right. is yeah. one A. Yeah. But yeah. when we zone through this, and then I presume it goes to the, I think the Ministry of Health also. Um, so in September, March, mm -hmm. and then yeah. both on big plus one, really amazing. There is, I think, on the teacher hub, there's a thing about TPD, isn't there? That there's a yeah, there is. There is a yeah. further down, there's a, yeah, the community connection and CPD yeah. continued professional yeah. development. So, involved in things like this, yeah. there's also opportunity because, again, one of the things that people say, gosh, it's really nice listening to a lecture. It's really nice to be back at the university. Yeah. But it's really been fantastic um, listening to your input as well. And yeah, it's, it's been good for us. Of I suppose, yeah, just to add, uh, we are always <coughs> want to hear from teachers if there's anything that we can do in terms of curricular enrichment, coming into schools, all that sort of stuff. Please do get in touch. Jenna, maybe it's the person to email about that. We haven't had a, uh, we've all talked to Jenna. You've yeah. all heard from Jenna. Jenna's the angel who She's looks <laughs> after <laughs> us all and keeps us all on the right track. Yeah. And it's been working amazingly hard. Yeah. And thank yeah. you. And through, she'll be in touch on, on things like Twitter and, and, yeah. and blogs and various things. But it's name will see again and I can see how busy English what people done with Paris so yeah. <laughs> Katie thank you one final and thing uh, if you guys any of you want we have some money from the embassy to pay travel costs uh, you need to have Jenna's got the forms you need to have either receipts from public transport or your mileage uh, but please if you want to claim that back please do claim that back yeah, because they give us some money I just wanted to say thanks to both yes of you thank you well. both for coming oh, yeah. Yeah. and I've yeah. also had one more pass from Nathaniel to do a two-minute quick talk. Uh, we've been speaking of research 
Do you want to stand up? Can you make a back? Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, Bruce, is that... <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking of, of research and CCD, which is very, very cheap. So there you go. Uh, I'm a member of the London Association for Teaching and Language Extra, which you might have heard of. Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> Good for you, you'll get to know who you are. LAPE is the London branch of NAIC, um, which you may be aware of, the National Association for Teaching and English, and we run um, currently English teacher CCD events, so we run one with the BFI, we ran one this year on um, using London as a resource, we ran another one this year on the joys and struggles of using GCSE, um, and we run lots of workshops, some of them are run by people at the English and Media Centre and things like that, some of them are run by the National Theatre, some of them are run by teachers, um, and if you are interested, uh, we're a bit low cost at the moment because we still have to do it on our website, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and let me either talk to you or your kids but what I've done so far is um, go into schools and watch kids watching the production and then interview them afterwards and talk to other teachers so a bit like what Louise was saying about how teachers often have a slightly different idea of why they're taking kids to the theatre than the students have about how they find places to host if you're willing to organise and we, you know, we can probably find a room um, maybe a person to come along and talk in your head away so yeah, any of those kind of ideas feed them back in and they'll give us full of useful questions but thank you so much